Okay, so hi everyone and welcome to um, our event, um, My Research Bite Sized. And we have six exciting speakers um, on medieval renaissance and early modern topics for you this afternoon. Um, I'm going to introduce each speaker as they come along and then they're going to do a three minute presentation on their research, um, at the end of which I will ring my bell. Um, and then uh, we'll move on to the next speaker. Um, so we'll hear from all six speakers um, and then we'll open up the floor to questions. So first up, um, we have um, Callum Coburn. Um, Callum is a first year PhD student in the English, literature, um, English Language and Literature Department at UCL. Um, he did his BA in English in 2015 and his MA in Medieval and Renaissance Studies in 2016. His research maps the changing representation of hell in Anglo-Saxon literature and art and the nature of the pagan Christian complex in Northern Europe during the early modern period. So over to you, Callum. Thanks very much. Um, yes, yeah, so that's essentially what I'm talking about, and that's what my research is all about, uh, understanding hell in the Anglo-Saxon period. Uh, Ang the Anglo-Saxon period is quite of an amazing uh, period in which uh, there are quite a few iconographic shifts and transformations, and because hell is a universal image, uh, what I've decided to do in my research is map it across literature and art in both uh, Lat Lat Latin literature and vernacular literature, so that encompasses sort of homiletic stuff, uh, vernacular poetry, heroic poetry, charter sanctions, things like that. And in the art, it involves manuscript illustration, sculpture, and material culture. Um, it's my belief that there are uh, certain significant motifs uh, to do with hell uh, that become dominant in the later medieval period and which have their origin during the Anglo-Saxon period uh, that sort of come about as the result of this kind of cultural synthesis that's happening uh, in Anglo-Saxon England. Um, one such motif that, that has kind of prompted my particular fascination is the mouth of hell, and I've included a couple of examples on the board. Uh, the left is from the Winter's Assault, which comes right at the end of the Anglo-Saxon period, technically. And as you can see, it involves sort of, uh, the entrance to hell being represented as the, the bestial mouth of it, an, an enormous uh, monster. As I say, people believe that this motif in particular was an, an Anglo-Saxon uh, innovation and that it emerged uh, during the post-monastic reform period um, as a result of this, this uh, as a result, kind of, of the, the monastic reform creating lots and lots more uh, manuscript production um, and enabling uh, artists uh, to create more elaborate decorations, and at the same time, uh, the influence of uh, continual Scandinavian invasions. That's the, the current belief. My own belief is that actually that this motif is far, has a far more extended tradition uh, that happens throughout the period, um, and I, you can see that reflected in. Uh, lots of different examples of, sort of charter sanctions uh, where you have kings threatening that uh, certain uh, that their followers are consumed um, or t torn apart by demons in the bowels of hell. Uh, there are other, other sort of eschatological motifs as well. So uh, on your right, I've included an example from uh, the Marvels of the East, which is a late 11th century manuscript. But as you can see, it has this kind of vaguely anthropomorphic uh, shifting landscape that uh, almost threatens to consume its inhabitants whole. Uh, the illustration itself depicts uh, a figure, a magician, raising a ghost from, from hell, and it, the ghost is pictured as an enormous demon. Uh, one of the other sort of developments that's happening during this period is a shift uh, from devils and demons being represented in, in an anthropomorphic way to a far more bestial way, because the Anglo-Saxons are obsessed with animals. And we'll stop you there. Thank you very much, Callum. Um, so now, um, on to our next speaker, um, Ryan Lowe. Um, Ryan is a first year student um, in the history department. He's from the United States and he's studying here in the UK with the support of a Marshall Scholarship. His studies focus primarily on the political power of ecclesiastical institutions in high medieval France. So, over to you, Ryan. Okay, great. Um, so Bernard Guy is best known as an inquisitor of heretics in southern France, and with pretty good reason, since over his 17 years as inquisitor of Toulouse, he heard over 900 cases, convicted over a third of those accused heretics, and sentenced dozens to death. What Bernard is less well known for is that he loved lists. 
He is the type of person who had lists of lists of lists. Uh, he had lists of popes, kings, and counts, bishops, priors, and abbots. Um, and these lists were very popular in the Middle Ages. They were copied by Dominican scriptoria from Portugal to Poland. But today, they largely escape the notice of historians. Administrative history isn't exactly fashionable or trendy or appealing in uh, any other way, um, but it should be. Uh, I'm reminded of the Joe Biden quote from 2012 in response to congressional Republicans when he said, uh, don't tell me your values, show me your budget and I'll tell you your values. This is the kind of idea behind why administrative history is so important and what we can get out of it. Um, so Bernard's administrative history, so his accounts of his meeting minutes from provincial and uh, general chapters of the Dominican order, his lists of priors and the foundation of individual convents, uh, they, they show us the values as well as the priorities and anxieties of the order of individual convents and of Bernard himself. Uh, take, for example, his history of the foundation and list of priors of, at the Dominican convent of Limoges. There we see that the Dominicans were, uh, went to great lengths to remain neutral during, 16 year, during a 16-year period of political conflict between bishops, the Viscount, uh, and the bourgeoisie. He shows the different political networks that the order tapped into when they wanted to raise the money to build a new dormitory or to build a new belfry or to build uh, a new library. In his Acts of the Provincial Chapter of the Dominican Order, Bernard allows us to peer into the young institution and the problems that it faced, right? Uh, priors ignoring the rules, or students uh, leaving their schools before the term was over, or uh, individual convents taking on too much debt. Bernard was an administrator who understood how to, guide, how to guide institutions through the problems they inevitably faced. He knew how systems of power had worked or had not worked before, uh, which policies succeeded and failed. So the image that I want to, of Bernard that I want to leave with you today is an imagined moment. It's an imagined moment, um, it's an imagined meeting between Bernard and let's say the prior of the convent of Limoges, the bishop of Limoges, the viscount, maybe a royal or papal official and all their associates. It's, it's in these moments um, that we most vividly and that we most vividly can imagine um, the power of, of understanding administrative history and why administrative history mattered and the values that guided institutions in their decision making and the way in which Bernard deploys these values. The uh, type of administrative history that Bernard wrote was the difference between being listened to and being ignored. Perfect, great. Thank you very much, Ryan. Um, so now we're moving on to Fred Carnegie. Um, Fred um, is a first year PhD student who works on early modern Spanish and European history. He's got a BA from King's College London in history and recently completed the early modern studies MA at UCL, following a few lost years working as an accountant. His project currently focuses on the links between climate change and the revolts um, and revolutions of the 17th century. So over to you, Fred. Thanks, Alex. Um, as you've heard, I work on the links between climate change and revolt in the 17th century. Ever since the early 1900s, historians have been asking why the middle of the 17th century saw an unusually high number of revolts, revolutions, and political unrest. The period 1640 to 1660 witnessed the English Civil War, the Fronde in France, revolt of the Catalans, revolt in Portugal, revolt in Naples, revolt in Ukraine against Polish rule, Mughal Civil War in India, the King invasion of China, to name just a few. Um, in the past few decades, climatologists have also become increasingly convinced that between the 14th century and the 19th century, the Earth's climate went through a little ice age, and the 17th century is often isolated as having experienced the most extreme episodes of this global climate change. This spike in the severity of the little ice age has been used as a unifying explanation for what has been dubbed the global crisis of the 17th century. My project focuses on some lesser known revolts in Andalusia, Spain, between 1647 and 1652. The advantage of picking this smaller local case study is that on the face of it, there are less complex social, political, and religious factors involved than say the English Civil War. And thus one could hope to more easily isolate the effects of climate change. So whilst the scope of my project may at first seem quite narrow, at its heart are two big questions. What are the mechanisms through which climate change might disrupt society? And why might people turn to political violence in times of hardship? The basic cause of the revolts in Andalusia was the high price of bread and it might seem fairly straightforward to explain this agricultural shortage via poor climate. But the complexity of the history, historical picture is at times overwhelming. 
Firstly, there's a difficulty in navigating the existing scientific literature to isolate the precise regional and local effects that li the Little Ice Age may have exerted in Andalusia. After this, you then need to prove the link between adverse climate, poor harvests, resulting price rises, and then those price rises leading to revolt. And human agency remains key in all these steps. People, of course, had adaptive strategies to cope with changes to the weather and climate. Crops could be diversified, farming methods adapted. From a price perspective, even if climate did disrupt harvests, one can ask whether the authorities would just have been able to purchase grain from further afield or abroad and investigate how local and national governments could regulate prices and grain markets using grain stores or market regulation. Beyond the more statistical, scientific and economic elements of the study, we also can't lose sight of the human aspect. Immense human suffering is a feature of many of the accounts of the period and the revolts, from starvation and hunger to mass death from plague, and we can't ignore the social and psychological traumas that people may have endured. All of the above culminates in a political reaction, revolt. Even if exogenous climate change is the determining factor in causing these revolts, and that's still an if, then we need to ask why people felt that revolt or revolution was the appropriate course of action to take to alleviate their suffering. Thanks. Great. Thanks very much, Fred. Um, so now we move on to Simone Webb. Um, Simone is a first-year PhD student in Gender Studies with the Centre for Multidisciplinary and Intercultural Inquiry at UCL. Her undergraduate degree was in Philosophy, Politics and Economics, and her Master's was in Women's Studies. And she's now working in a hazy space between history of philosophy, intellectual history and genre theory. So, over to you, Simone. Thank you. Hey, Damaris Masham, Mary Astle, Catherine Coburn. Three women I'd be willing to bet you haven't heard of. When I tell people my PhD is about early modern women philosophers, they often think about Mary Wollstonecraft. Now, Wollstonecraft's great, but the latest of my three women thinkers, Catherine Coburn, died a full 10 years before Wollstonecraft was even born. The earliest, Damaris Masham, died 50 years before Wollstonecraft's birth. So who are these women? They're all broadly middle class, British, and born after the English Civil War. And of course, they all do philosophy. So they all publish carefully reasoned books about philosophical topics. Astor writes about the nature of knowledge, God, politics. Masham talks about love, society, women's education. Coburn mainly writes about the foundations of morality. So it's all stuff that's very clearly philosophy, and it's the stuff that means they get talked about as philosophers today. But philosophy is not just about abstract theory and arguments set out in published books, although that's usually how it's done today. Going back to ancient times, there's actually a way of thinking about philosophy as a way of life, a way of being in the world and relating to yourself and others. So this sort of philosophy isn't just about writing down arguments, it's about living well, using reason to change yourself, sometimes even using philosophy as a kind of therapy. And I think all three of my women here did this kind of philosophy as well. And they did it in ways which really tie into their gender and their lives as early modern women. So in opposition to the calm reasoning of her published work, Damaris Masham undergoes a turbulent process of philosophical self-creation in her very intimate letters to the famous philosopher John Locke. Her struggles and her conflict with herself and the world around her are deeply connected to her unhappiness with her roles of wife and mother. Astor, in her most famous book, A Serious Proposal to the Ladies, sets out a program of life in philosophy that can free women from the oppressive customs of early modern British society. Coburn writes letters to her niece in which she acts as a philosophical guide, almost a Socratic figure, a rare relationship to find between two women in the period. For all three women, philosophical activity goes beyond philosophical arguments published in books. So why care? Well, I want my work to challenge about how you think about the history of philosophy and about how you think about philosophy itself. So it's not just abstract arguments. Philosophy can be about how you live. By looking at how these women lived philosophy 300 years ago, we can think about what it might mean to live philosophical lives and to cultivate ourselves using philosophy today, and what kind of challenges might face women in particular when doing so. Great. Thank you very much, Simone. Um, now we move on to Paolo Gattabari. 
Um, and Paolo is a first year PhD student in the Italian department, um, working on his PhD in Renaissance studies. His research focuses on the Renaissance discovery of Lucian of Samosata, a, satir uh, a satirist and rhetorician of the second century AD. So, over to you, Paolo. Yeah, perfect, thank you. Um, as you heard, uh, my research focuses on the Renaissance rediscovery of Lucian of Samosata. Lucian was a rhetorician and satirist of the second century AD. He was born in, uh, in Samosata, uh, which is in, um, uh, in the Roman province of Comagine, in eastern Syria. Uh, his corpus uh, is, ab is of about uh, 80 works, uh, all composed in Attic Greek, and includes uh, dialogues, uh, short narrative fictions, mock encomia, and short essays. Irony and uh, parodic recreation of Greek cultural heritage are some of his main traits. Um, during the Latin Middle Ages, Lucian Corpus was al almost completely unknown, whereas it was read and commented in Byzantium. Uh, during the Renaissance, the, the rediscovery of Lucian was a significant phenomenon. In 1397, the Byzantine scholar Manuel Crisolorar started to teach a Greek seminar in Florence using Lucian uh, dialogues as textbooks. From this moment onwards, uh, Lucian Corpus attracted the attention of many humanists who started to translate uh, his works uh, in, mainly in Latin but uh, also in vernacular. Um, uh, Lucian, Lucian writings uh, started also to inspire humanists in writing their own satire. Lucian Corpus was a sort of encyclopedia on which humanists drew with regard to many themes and motives, uh, uh, such as uh, the attack of people in power, uh, satirical portrayals of philosophers, and the critique of many social and religious vices. Uh, this process led to the establishment of what we can call uh, Lucianic literature, uh, which includes authors such as uh, Leon Battista Alberti, Giovanni Pontano, Pandolfo Colenuccio, and Ludovic Ariosto. But it was uh, not only an Italian phenomenon, but was a European phenomenon, um, particularly imbued with Lucianic traits, were also the works by um, uh, François Rabelais, Thomas More, and Erasmus. Um, the Lucian, uh, Lucian dialogues were essential for the development of some literary gender, especially many pen satire, which is a particular type of satire combining comedy and philosophy, and the mocking comium, so consisting the praise of what is usually regarded as insignificant. So the, the main questions guiding me in my research are how humanists borrow and reshape um, Lucianic themes and uh, literary structures in order to develop a, a satire uh, of a different kind from its medieval counterpart. And another important question is how um, the Lucianic literature is interrelated with um, a new and critical concept of literature and the new scientific and philosophical theories uh, which spread during the 15th and the 16th century. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Paolo. Um, and our final speaker today um, is Umberto Veronesi, who um, is an archaeologist who moved from fieldwork to the lab where he conducts chemical analyses on archaeological materials to understand ancient technologies. He's a first year PhD student here in this building in the Institute of Archaeology, um, and he studies the material side of alchemy in an effort to bring together archaeology and the history of science. So, over to you, Umberto. Thank you very much, and you can change the first slide. What is alchemy? This is the very inspiring question that started this project. Because when we think about alchemy, we tend to imagine uh, things like this image here. So crazy looking people working in their laboratories, uh, full of smoke and obviously doomed to failure. Because we imagine alchemy as a discipline much, much more uh, linked to magic and superstition that, than to modern science and the modern scientific method. Or we can also uh, think about alchemy as um, obscure, esoteric images that populate the alchemical literature and do not make much sense to us. Or again, we imagine alchemy mostly as the making of gold, for example, or the quest for the Philosopher's Stone. But the truth is different, and historians now tend to see alchemy as a much more multifaceted and dynamic uh, discipline, one which had at its core the manipulation of natural substances in order to unlock the secrets of nature, to understand and make sense of the surrounding world. 
And for this reason, a lot of those very weird and allegorical images like that one always have a link to actual uh, laboratory practices of the early modern period, like the crucible that is visible over there. Um, alchemy was not just about making gold. Alchemy was about using fire to transform matter, and therefore everything, every product of the furnace can actually be considered a product, a product of alchemy. And in this sense, glass is a chiefly alchemical product because it embodies a lot of important alchemical concepts, like, for example, uh, the power of human art to imitate nature, or the transmutation of humble so substances in something much more beautiful and much more valuable, as it were. So my research is, um, wants to bring together archaeology and the history of science. I will analyze um, glass-making remains coming from alchemical laboratories, uh, trying to understand what was going on inside of those furnaces, in the, inside of those crucibles, what materials they were using, and what processes. And I will then insert these results into broader narratives related to early modern uh, scientific and experimental uh, processes and the uh, underlying knowledge and theories that drove these processes and fueled them. Thank you. Great. Perfect timing as well. So thank you very much to our six speakers. Um, and I hope you'll agree that we've got some really fascinating research going on in medieval um, Renaissance and early modern studies here at UCL. And now I'd like to open up the floor to questions. So anyone from the audience and also panellists, feel free to ask questions of each other as well. Um, and I'll repeat the questions um, so that everyone can hear them. And we'll pass the microphone.